The 1950s, the jet age, a time when the world opened up for everyday travelers. Airlines sprang up to cater for every market. Down to Boston, over to El Paso, into Chicago, out to Portland, Oregon. Nine and one half hours from coast to coast. Four and one half hours from Jackson, Mississippi to Detroit, Michigan. North, south, east, west. There are 27 scheduled airlines. There are almost 600 airline stops. Every major city, every state in the 48, touched on by the unseen high roads of the sky. The easiest method of travel yet devised by man. Businessmen in particular travel the airline. Pre-war airline travel was sold as a luxury experience. Post-war flying was more about the comforts of home and exceptional customer service. It was about speed, convenience and efficiency. Scenes of living room quiet and relaxation. The mood enhanced by lighting that can be changed from the pale pink of dawn through all the variations to the dark blue of night. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain again. I've just been talking with flight control at London Airport. The temperature there is 64 degrees and the weather is clear. If you haven't already changed your watches to conform to the time difference, I suggest you do so now. We are now making our descent. I won't be speaking to you again as we'll be in our landing pattern over London in the next few minutes. It was a pleasure to have you aboard our jet clipper. We hope to have you with us again soon. Thank you. to London in the same time that it takes you to go and see a baseball doubleheader. New York to London in six and a half magic hours. It all goes so fast now and it's so comfortable that you feel as if you hadn't traveled at all. Many hours gained and no sleep lost. to Paris, seven hours, only 30 minutes longer than to London. Paris, right away you're in the swim of things, because once more you've landed refreshed and with extra hours to do what you want to do in a leisurely way. Experiences like these, which used to be rare events for the few or the few thousand, are becoming neighborly visits for the millions, because international air traffic, already increased fivefold during the last 12 years, now undergoes its greatest change. Jet speeds will help to accomplish one of man's long-sought goals, an easy interchange of peoples throughout the world. Transoceanic flights now become short hops, six and a half magic hours to Europe. Airlines looked to new technologies to cope with ever-increasing passenger numbers. In the new and changing world of jet travel, the speed in getting there will be matched by unprecedented speed and accuracy in flight bookings. A worldwide electronic reservations and communication system will link 114 cities on six continents with a data processing center located in the new Pan American building under construction in New York City. In the uncompleted fourth floor room where the computer system will be installed, Pan Am President Juan T. Tripp and Thomas J. Watson Jr., board chairman of IBM, sign the contract for the multi-million dollar installation. 
fine personnel almost anywhere in the free world will maintain two-way contact with powerful twin computers which retain necessary information on magnetic disk files. At telegraph speed, the electronic clearinghouse will book and confirm seats on flights, provide reservation for air cargo, and handle other specific requirements. Service for the traveling public to the globe-girdling tempo of the jet age. Originally the queen of the world's clipper flying boat services, Pan American Airlines entered the jet age with the $15 million Boeing 707. Its flight 001 from San Francisco circled the globe, taking passengers to cities like Tokyo, Delhi, Beirut and London. The Boeing 707, which flew the New York to Paris route, was dubbed Clipper America, a nod to the great transatlantic flying boats. At Pan Am's request, Boeing modified its five-seater cross configuration to seat six people, which brought down the costs per head and contributed to lower fares. The British Overseas Airways Corporation was competing with Pan Am from the other side of the Atlantic. BOAC Flight 906 to Karu, Karachi, Calcutta, Bangkok, Hong Kong and Tokyo. Will passengers please go to the south exit? Like the Americans, British Airlines were keen to portray air travel as suitable for the masses, not just a privileged few. The air, said an 18th century seer, is an uninterrupted navigable ocean that comes to every man's door. Today, the airlines of many nations have turned that vision into commonplace fact. Their gleaming silver and flashing air screws are at every man's door, tempting him into the blue. At airports from London to Rio and Dum Dum, you can sample the stir and bustle that never ceases the clock round. Glimpse behind the scenes, the wonders of radio and radar that now, according to statistics, render you safer in the air than in your own home. You can travel 21,184,000 miles before you can reasonably expect to be killed in an air accident. That's over 88 return trips to the moon. And aloft, cruising in comfort at 10 or 20,000 feet, it's free meals, no tips, and the papers delivered to your chair. Jules Verne dreamed of circling the Earth in 80 days. Now you can do it in just about as many hours. And all the baggage you require to circumnavigate the globe is a toothbrush and a powder puff. To the United Kingdom, seeking by every means to increase her trade abroad, the swift onset of the air age presents a special challenge. BOAC formed British European Airways Corporation after the war to replace flights within Europe previously operated by the Royal Air Force. BEA swallowed up several smaller regional airlines and flew passengers and cargo all over the continent and North Africa. Now, only a few years later, the name of British European Airways is well known all over Europe. Under the management of Lord Douglas of Kirtleside, himself a celebrated airman, BEA's routes fan out from London to cover the continent from Scandinavia to Spain. Starting virtually from scratch after the war, its services of freight and mail are making it a very real factor in the economic integration of Europe. Swiftly becoming the largest airline entirely devoted to European traffic, BEA now carries nearly one million passengers a year on business or pleasure bent from Prague to Belfast. Already familiar as well throughout the great cities of the world are the initials BOAC. British Overseas Airways Corporation. This is Britain's long distance airline. Now organized to keep more than 50 planes moving above the globe every minute of the day and night.
To BOAC's chairman, Sir Miles Thomas, falls the task of supervising nearly 200,000 miles of routes, many of which did not exist before the war. First, to fly the Atlantic regularly in both directions, BOAC captains now look down on the towers of New York as old familiar friends. Others skim the glittering Caribbean, courses set for the hard currency trade and tourism of the South American republics. As well as supplying their own thriving air routes, British aircraft manufacturers exported to airlines around the world. In 1957, the first Britannia airliner to be delivered from Bristol to an overseas operator was officially handed over to El Al, Israel Airlines. The Britannia flew direct from the Bristol Airplane Company's headquarters in Filton to Lod Airport in Israel. The aircraft, 4X AGA, was one of the long-range 310 series Britannias, a more advanced version of the earlier models operated on BOAC routes. The prototype long-range Britannia had made a short flight to Tel Aviv a couple of months earlier as it amassed many flying hours en route, proving and test flights. An enthusiastic crowd greeted the new aeroplane. Following the formal handover ceremony, sightseers were allowed to look over the Britannia and admired its cushioned seats and fold-back chairs. Founded in 1948, when the State of Israel was established, El Al Airlines flew all over the world. After receiving the Britannia, the airline ran advertisements featuring a shrunken Atlantic Ocean with the tagline, starting December 23, the Atlantic will be 20% smaller to promote its non-stop transatlantic flights. The ad ran only once but proved very successful, with El Al tripling its sales in the following year. Another airline spreading its reach around the world was the Soviet national carrier Aeroflot. Founded in 1923, Aeroflot had become the world's largest airline by the end of the 1930s, operating more than 4,000 aircraft. But unlike the decadent West, Aeroflot did not pride itself on its friendly cabin staff or efficient in-flight service. Throughout the Soviet era, the airline had a reputation for service with a scowl, as it was a government-run monopoly that did not need to compete for passengers. The airline flew only Soviet-made aircraft, such as the Ilyushin IL-18, which became one of the most popular and long-lasting turboprop airliners ever built. The first IL-18 was powered by four NK-4 turboprop engines, but the following year they were replaced by Ivchenko AL-20 engines. As well as commercial air routes, Aeroflot undertook operations such as crop spraying, aerial surveying, airborne rescue and flying ambulance services. Aeroflot also flew the Tupolev 114 turboprop, a long-range airliner that came into its own when the Soviets put a ban on Western airports during a time of Cold War tensions in the early 1960s. The TU-114 was able to fly non-stop between Moscow and Havana, Cuba, a 7,000-mile journey. In January 1963, passengers returning to Moscow on the long-haul flight included cosmonaut Pavel Popovich, who had traveled to Cuba to be a guest at the fourth anniversary celebrations of the Cuban Revolution. With growing passenger demand in the 1960s due to falling ticket prices, the Soviet government invested more money in airport facilities. Proper waiting rooms were built to replace the primitive holding pens of the earlier era. By 1967, Aeroflot fares were competitive with railway fares, and the airline soon had the lion's share of the long-haul travel business. But Aeroflot continued to suffer from a Western perception that its service and safety standards were lower than those of its counterparts in the free world. When the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s, Aeroflot safety standards did indeed plummet. However, in the intervening years, the airline has re-established its record and still operates from a number of countries around the world. 
German airline Lufthansa was another pre-war airline that flourished in the jet age. A new version of the airline resumed scheduled flights in 1955 and quickly established itself as an important European operation. It started with Lockheed Super Constellations and began jet services in 1960 using four Boeing 707s between Frankfurt and New York. East Germany also called its airline Lufthansa, but was forced to change the name to Interflug, as the West German Lufthansa was already in the air. Lufthansa was banned from flying into West Berlin throughout the communist years. The Danes also started their first passenger service in the 1950s, flying over the inhospitable reaches of the Arctic. Los Angeles, a milestone in the Pacific coast, its own gateway to Europe. Colonel Bernd Balkan, veteran Arctic explorer, and his wife are among the distinguished passengers pioneering the polar route. First, 1,522 miles to Edmonton, a fueling stopover. Then on to Thule, Greenland, via the North Pole. First commercial airliner to use the facilities of the strategic U.S. Air Force Base. Finally, Copenhagen. Scandinavian Airlines System's polar route became a popular choice for Los Angeles-based celebrities traveling to Europe. SAS also became the first airline to offer a round-the-world service over the North Pole in 1957. Over in Britain, Silver City Airways discovered a lucrative market operating cross-channel flights to France for passengers and their cars. The Air Ferry was so successful that the company opened its own airport in Kent, called Ferryfield, in 1954. The fare was four pounds per passenger and 25 pounds per car. In its next four years of operation, the airline carried half a million passengers and 137,000 cars. Another form of passenger transport gaining favor in the 1950s was the helicopter. The earliest rotary aircraft were precarious machines, but their hovering capabilities made them attractive for military use, and the Second World War spurred development. By the end of the war, those considering the transport needs of tomorrow saw the helicopter as a potential commuter aircraft that could sail over the traffic jams of the city and deposit its passengers on the roof of a building. Like a runaway express train, the Bristol 173, the flying railway carriage, goes through its paces. Futurists envisaged multi-level car parts with rooftop landing bays for helicopters. Modern aviation has made great progress in recent years. Huge airliners carry into the sky each day an ever larger tonnage of cargoes and passengers. Jet propulsion has made possible extremely high speed. Yet in one aspect, these aircraft have become more limited than before, since they need exceptionally long runways to take off and land. The need for an aircraft independent of huge airfields is being met today by the helicopter, which can land in any area big enough for its whirling rotor. Helicopters are being used today for a wide variety of jobs, which can't be handled by other aircraft. In larger cities, they are delivering thousands of pounds of mail every day from outlying airports directly to the post office. These craft can carry some 400 pounds of mail on each trip. And in some cities, trips are made throughout the day at 20 minute intervals. Flying over city traffic, the helicopter can land directly on the roof of the post office itself in a fraction of the time needed by mail trucks, thus greatly speeding the delivery of mail. Helicopters have found important uses in the country too, where they are used for dusting crops, which would be damaged by ground equipment. The helicopter's great maneuverability makes it possible to spread dust over every corner of the field, no matter how irregular it may be. The sharp downdraft of the whirling rotor causes dust to swirl among the plants, thus giving them a more thorough coating. There are a 
number of different kinds of helicopters being flown today. Some are designed with two rotors, which turn in opposite directions. Each rotor counteracts the torque action of the other, and thus eliminates the need for an anti-torque tail rotor. Twin rotor helicopters have been built large enough to carry 16 persons, with a gross weight of more than 14,000 pounds. The jet helicopter, powered by tiny jet engines on the tips of the rotor blades, works much like a fireworks pinwheel. The jet engines are the only source of power. Jet helicopters are simpler in construction, lighter and easier to operate than conventional helicopters, although fuel consumption is very high. The continued development of this and other types of helicopters with their unprecedented freedom of movement and the wide range of uses to which they can be put hold great promise for the future of transportation. Who could have predicted the vast changes which the development of the automobile and the truck have brought about in our society? The potentialities of the helicopter are just as great. Its versatility as a transportation vehicle may eventually play an important role in reshaping the pattern of our daily living. In 1954, helicopters made civil aviation history in England when a helicopter flew a passenger flight between Heathrow and South Bank. The scenic trip gave passengers good views of London's icons as the aircraft flew along the Thames River. British airline BEA was keen to incorporate helicopters into its passenger fleet. Its chief executive, Peter Maysfield, saw a future where the journey time from London to Paris was reduced from three and a half hours by fixed-wing aircraft to one and a half by helicopter. The company became the first in the world to operate helicopter-scheduled passenger services between Liverpool and Cardiff. However, with accommodation for just three passengers, the service was uneconomical and only lasted a year. The biggest obstacle to helicopter airlines was the difficulty in reducing passenger mile costs, something fixed-wing airliners were able to achieve with ease as they increased in size. The 1950s also saw the United States establishing its first helicopter service in 1958. In New York City, the world's first scheduled passenger helicopter airline inaugurates new service with twin rotor whirlybirds. The big ships carrying 15 passengers go into shuttle service between Manhattan and New York's outlying airports. For the air travelers, it offers a spectacular sightseeing ride from a tandem rotor flying banana. While taking a flight in a flying banana was a novelty for sightseers, the Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation still saw a market for commuter helicopters. The company pushed ahead with a 28-seat helicopter designed specifically for airline use to airline standards. The Sikorsky S61L was powered by twin gas turbines and could fly on just one engine if necessary. If required to operate over water, the helicopter could be sealed to transform it into an amphibious aircraft. The S61L quickly became one of Sikorsky's most popular helicopters and went into service as a passenger helicopter as well as a support aircraft for offshore oil rigs. A stripped down version was used for aerial crane work. But helicopter airliners never achieved the popularity envisaged by early enthusiasts due to their high operating costs. Instead, the helicopter's flexibility saw it become an important tool for police, ambulance, firefighters, and news gatherers. Aeroplanes themselves were found in the news with increasing frequency. In 1956, a Hungarian civil airliner was hijacked by anti-communist students and diverted to a NATO Air Force base in Germany. There was a savage in-flight struggle between the seven students and ten pro-government passengers and crew. Twelve people were hospitalized, including five of the escaped conspirators. 
the plane dropped from 4,000 to 800 feet before the hijackers seized the controls. Despite being faint from loss of blood, one of the students piloted the plane to the ground and enabled the group to defect to the west. While new airliners captured the world's attention in the 1950s, some pilots still prefer the simplicity of the old. It's the same scene the world over, and it happens whether a man buses or cycles to work. But Captain Ronald Gilman's one up on the rest of us toilers. No season ticket for him, he's got loftier thoughts. the advances which have come in 20 years. Very different this from the simple layout of his private vintage cockpit. No need for goggles and hood and a less drafty perch, but it's just not done to call the control column a joystick. The same old signal, the same old response, and that just about sums the whole thing up. As the aviation business grew, so did the range of cargo. In 1952, a KLM flight from Burma carried a particularly unusual pair of passengers, a baby elephant and a hen. Two years later, a flight to Korea contained a veritable Noah's Ark of livestock. The animals were part of a relief effort to aid Koreans made destitute by the war. However, the goats did not appear particularly happy to be making an overseas flight. Transocean Airlines, which operated the flight, specialized in flying difficult cargo into hard-to-reach places. The pilots were given cash to cover their expenses and get them out of sticky situations. From plane loads of pilgrims traveling to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina during Hajj, to monkeys transported to the United States for the Salk polio vaccine program, the airline's pilots saw it all. Transocean was an early version of today's budget airlines, but fell victim to enhanced safety regulations. And as airline travel expanded, safety became a paramount concern for governments around the world. Tragedy comes to South Wales, as near the village of Sigginston, Glamorganshire, lies the wreckage of a giant Tudor 5 airliner, largest British type in regular service, in which 80 lives were lost out of a total of 83 passengers and crew. The added horror of fire was narrowly averted when the plane missed this high-tension wire as it plunged to earth near its home airport. Most of the passengers returning from Ireland were Welsh rugby supporters who only a few hours before had seen their team win the Triple Crown.
cleared the scene of the disaster was Lord Pakenham, Minister for Civil Aviation, to make a first-hand investigation, preliminary to a public inquiry. Meanwhile, the sympathy of the whole nation goes out to those bereaved by this, the worst tragedy in the history of civil flying. A pillar of smoke rising from the rugged King Mountain area, only minutes flying time from San Francisco International Airport, marks the tragic end to an 8,600-mile flight from Australia. All aboard the luxury liner, 11 passengers and eight crewmen died when the plane smashed into the 2,000-foot level of the hillside and burned. The threat of forest fire added to the strain of working in this precipitous terrain. The huge increase in scheduled flights and passengers inevitably led to a rise in fatal accidents, and there was big pressure on governments to impose stringent safety regulations. The September 1954 crash of a super constellation operated by Dutch airline KLM brought home the risks of aviation. En route to New York from Amsterdam, the Flying Dutchman made a refueling stop at Ireland's Shannon Airport. Less than a minute after taking off again, the aircraft crashed into mudflats on the Shannon River, killing 28 of 56 people on board. The official investigation found that the captain failed to respond adequately to an unexpected gear re-extension and was unable to maintain altitude. There was also criticism of Shannon Tower, which did not realize an airplane had gone down until the navigator staggered into the airport covered in mud. On the fringe of a Munich airport lies the wreckage of an airliner, still smoldering from a crash in which 21 people were killed. Tragedy enough at any time. But in that plane were a group of young men who were almost the personal friends of millions. Manchester United, the finest soccer team Britain has produced since the war. And seven of them died in the crash. On February the 6th, 1958, the football world was plunged into mourning when a charter plane crashed on its way from Belgrade to Manchester, killing most of the Manchester United football team. Conditions were deteriorating when the plane carrying the players, team officials, journalists and supporters landed in Munich to refuel. By the time they were ready to take off, a blizzard had set in. On a runway made treacherous by snow and ice, two attempts to take off were aborted. On the fateful third, the plane burst off the runway at high speed, skidded through a fence, crossed a road, and exploded. Included in the 21 people who lost their lives were seven Man United players, the club secretary, trainer, and coach. Among the survivors were Bobby Charlton, Ray Wood, Harry Gregg, Bill Fawkes, a seriously injured Duncan Edwards, and manager Matt Busby, who was twice given the last rites. The Queen herself sent a message of condolence, saying she was deeply shocked. Even with Matt Busby still close to death and Duncan Edwards fighting a losing battle, life had to go on. Just 13 days after the crash, United played again at home in a fifth-round FA Cup tie against Sheffield Wednesday. Playing on a tide of emotion, they won 3-0. But two days later, Duncan Edwards lost his fight to survive and the sadness of Munich was rekindled. With such alarming images beaming around the world, authorities were keen to emphasize the steps being taken to enhance aviation safety. Air traffic in and out of London and all international airports increases year by year. Boarding a special comet at London Airport, airline experts from all over the world saw a demonstration of a highly accurate navigating aid perfected in Britain. It enables a pilot to keep dead on course at all times. Near airports, it makes it possible for planes to come in with minimum delay. The visitors saw on a navigator flight log how a pen follows a line previously drawn on the chart. The pilot steers the aircraft along the line, thus knowing exactly where he is. The radio waves from a master transmitter and two others called slave stations form a lattice of position lines within which the location of the aircraft is shown to the pilot. The slave stations are so called because they are operated automatically by the master transmitter. If the system is generally adopted after the forthcoming Montreal conference, the work of British radio engineers will result in greater airline safety throughout the world. New technology was enabling airlines to fly in any conditions. Here we are flying on instruments. We're in the clouds. 
It's one of those nights that the birds aren't even walking. We have been cleared to make an instrument approach. We have been cleared to the outer marker. This point we call the outer marker is located approximately five miles from the end of the runway. A light flashes on the cockpit panel. At the same time, the ADF needle indicates the passage of the marker, and we also get an audio signal. And at this point, the glide path is intercepted. The glide path is a sloping radio beacon down which the aircraft should make its descent to the runway and is indicated by the horizontal needle. When the needle is centered, the aircraft is on the glide path. If the needle moves above center, the aircraft is low and must climb back to the path. If the needle is below center, we're high on the glide path. This is a big help in itself. But in addition to the ILS, the instrument landing system, we have GCA, that is ground control approach. And that can give additional valuable assistance. Radar monitoring on uh, localizer voice as you approach the outer marker. By means of this radar, the GCA controller sees the approaching plane as a bit of light moving on his scope and can direct it safely to the airport. When the flight has been directed to the approach course, it is turned over to the radar monitor for final approach. Radar to Eastern, you're approaching the ILS course. Turn to a heading of 247, and I'm turning you over to the radar monitor for final approach. This is radar monitor. Etched right on the scope is both glide path and localizer, and any deviation can be detected and measured in feet. You are four miles from the end of the runway, 200 feet to the right, of course, but correcting nicely. Your glide path is good. You are three miles from the end of the runway. Your course is good. Glide path slightly low, but okay. You are two miles from the end of the runway. Your course is good. You're now approaching the middle marker. You're over the middle marker. The approach light should be coming into view. Approach lights in view. Thank you, GCA. That column of lights ahead shows the approach to the end of the airport runway. Each bar of light is 100 feet apart, and that ball of light traveling away from us at such a high rate of speed is leading us right to the approach end of the runway itself. The green lights mark the start of the runway, and the border lights on each side stretching out into the distance outline a mile and a half of airstrip just waiting for us to land on. Diana Brown, a secretary from Buckinghamshire, becomes the first woman to volunteer as a live crash test dummy. With research showing that people were more likely to die from hitting the interior of a plane than in the crash itself, seat belts became an important focus of aviation safety. It was Seth H. Stoner, a Navy pilot during World War II, who invented the aeroplane seat belt to aid pilots taking off and landing on aircraft carriers. The idea spread to civilian aviation and aircraft manufacturers carried out tests to measure the effectiveness of various configurations. Using human guinea pigs as well as crash test dummies in the testing gave manufacturers a better idea of how well their product would stand up in the event of a 100 mile an hour aircraft crash. In this case, the belts and seats do a good job absorbing the shock of the impact and the company is able to put the prototype into production. Navigation was another aspect of aviation continually being upgraded. London Airport, and every other big one in the world, is handling more and more traffic each year. The air lanes are crowded, potentially a danger to air travel. All possible aids to safety are welcomed. Changed indeed are the conditions today from those when Alcock and Brown made the first Atlantic crossing. Now the big jets go out and come in on routine schedule. Few passengers give a thought to the scientific know-how in the control tower as they take off or land. 
And now at Biggin Hill, a plane demonstrates automatic navigation, a development of the Decker Navigator. The pilot has a pictorial display on which his exact position is shown by a pen on a moving chart. Position and other information are shown here at Biggin Hill on a chart identical to the one in the aircraft. Hence, the flight facts are known all the time the plane is in the air. On a chart of larger scale is plotted the aircraft's approach to the landing ground, guaranteeing a spot-on descent. If the Decker system is widely adopted, safety will be considerably increased. Aeroplane flight systems increased in complexity throughout the 1950s and 60s, so pilot training was a priority. Flying was a highly competitive field with many pilots coming to the job via the Air Force. But a private pilot's license with at least 100 hours of flight time was also well regarded. The selection process included IQ and psychological tests, then the successful candidates underwent stringent training pilots needed a thorough understanding of automated systems, as well as the ability to think on their feet if one of the systems failed. Airlines discovered that lists of procedures were an effective way of drilling information into pilots and giving them something to focus on in high-pressure situations. Pilots needed specialized training for each type of airplane they flew, and the training was updated every year to ensure pilots were up to date with the newest technology. The introduction of flight simulators was a significant money saver, as it meant that trainees could learn in a safe environment without endangering themselves or the aircraft they were learning to fly. By readjusting his controls, the pilot puts the ship right in the groove. Ground control instruments keep exact track of the incoming plane's altitude and direction. In the thickest fog or darkest night, all the safety systems available could not protect civilian airliners from military aggression. In 1952, an Air France flight got a fright when two Russian MiG-15s opened fire on the DC-4, causing major damage and wounding three passengers. The aircraft was riddled with 89 bullets, but the pilot was able to shut down number three and four engines and make a safe emergency landing at Berlin Tempelhof Airport. Russian authorities claimed the airliner had strayed off the West Berlin Air Corridor into its territory. However, in the context of Cold War tensions, it appeared that the attack was unprovoked and was a deliberate act of aggression against the West. A more deadly attack occurred in 1954, when a squadron of Chinese LA-7s shot down a Cathay Pacific Airways Douglas C-54 Skymaster off the coast of Hainan Island, killing 10 of the 19 people on board. China said it mistook the airplane for a Chinese nationalist warplane. There was drama at the Pentagon after news that U.S. Navy planes had shot down two Chinese fighters. Admiral Felix Stump, CNC Pacific Fleet, told reporters his ships and planes were searching for survivors from the British Cathay Pacific Skyways airliner, which was murderously shot down by the Chinese on a routine flight Singapore to Hong Kong. Nine people killed. From his carriers Hornet and Philippine Sea, two planes were searching when two Chinese fighters attacked, U.S. defensive fire made short work of them. No American casualties. Later at the White House, President Eisenhower conferred with Mr. Dulles and the British ambassador. Firm answer to red barbarity. While airliners were created for the masses, there was still a market in the aviation industry for luxury travel. And it didn't come much more luxurious than this specially adapted DC-4, captained by Thomas Keegan. Formerly the property of an American mining magnate who traveled the world with his butler in attendance, the airplane was up for sale in 1962 for a hefty 100,000 pounds. Captain Thomas Keegan said the president of a new African republic had indicated his interest in the aircraft. Cabin attendant Siti Baizwara Hussein showed potential customers the gold-class service they could expect in the luxury plane. Its features included a shower room complete with gold fittings and an automatic radar system to warn of bad weather ahead. The lucky owner could also relax and enjoy a drink in Chippendale chairs beneath a chandelier. 
A rear bedroom could be converted into an office complete with a gold and ivory telephone. The whole aeroplane had sleeping accommodation for up to 16 people. Luxury travel also included aerial premieres, the ultimate publicity stunt. Flying London to New York carries the hope of a film treat. Bob Hope, that is, in person, bringing his new MGM comedy hit, Bachelor in Paradise, aboard. Our route for the Broadway premiere, Bob will see fellow passengers entertained at a super jet preview, an in-flight showing while making the transatlantic run. Each seat has a featherweight headset and individual volume control. Bob himself enjoys rare relaxation. The preview, 35,000 feet above the ocean, draws this comment from Hope. It's one time I was sure there'd be no walkouts. Air travel in the golden age of airliners included both everyday passengers and the most famous people in the world. To London Airport, a champion returns home from Vienna and with something to smile about. For Johnny Leach has regained for Britain the World Table Tennis Singles Championship he won in 1949. With him are two more triumphant winners, Rosalind and Diane Rowe, the 17-year-old Middlesex twins, proud possessors of the women's doubles title. As Johnny Leach and the Rowe sisters join in a welcome revival of British sport. Well done. A Qantas V-Jet arrives in Sydney from Hong Kong, and on board is famous English actor, composer, playwright and author Noel Coward. And then off again, this time to board a plane for Melbourne. No newsreel of the 1950s or 60s was complete without shots of a glamorous star emerging from an aeroplane to greet throngs of newsmen gathered on the tarmac. Crowds of hysterical girls thronged to airports around the world to welcome the Beatles to their shores. The group sometimes flew BEA, and Ringo famously held a sign that said TLES next to the airline's insignia on at least one occasion. British star Claire Bloom, enigmatic Yul Brynner, the marvelous Marlene Dietrich, Hollywood legend Clark Gable, ballet dancer Margot Fontaine, suave Cary Grant, a young Julie Andrews returning from her first trip to America, Fred McMurray and his wife, British star of stage and screen Angela Lansbury, American good guy Gregory Peck, Lovebirds Elizabeth Taylor and Mike Todd. Crooner Frank Sinatra. And Britt Eklund and husband Peter Sellers all contributed to the glamour of air travel. And none more than the greatest of them all on her first visit to England. Down in the passenger list as Mr. and Mrs. Miller, a honeymoon couple arrive in Britain to face the biggest headline since Caxton set up in business. Yes, it's Marilyn Monroe arriving with her playwright husband, Arthur Miller. Flash bulbs were popping from every angle, but Marilyn had nothing to say for the microphone. Making her first visit, Marilyn is to film with Sir Lawrence Olivier, who, with his wife Vivian Lee, led the airport welcome to the girl who knocked the cricket headlines for six. Soon there was so much pressure on London's Heathrow Airport that services expanded to Gatwick Airport, 46 kilometres south of the city. Queen Elizabeth II officially opened the new airport in 1958. I'm sure that this airport has a great future before it. I congratulate all those who by their labor, their planning and their skill have played a part in building it. And I wish good fortune to all those who will use it. The association of Hollywood and air travel helped the airlines sell aspirational holidays. In 1953, Air France started Sun Airlines, a vacation flight that took British holidaymakers from the dankness of an English autumn to the sun-filled paradise of France's Riviera. In just a few hours, passengers could leave behind their humdrum lives and fly direct to one of the most exciting regions on the planet. The promotional film highlighted the exciting activities on offer, 
that included the Riviera's famous casinos, the cabarets showing France's best theater shows, and the opportunities for romance in an elegant setting. America's Riviera jet setter vacations were a little less restrained. Go, go, go. Take a National Airlines Miami Go-Go vacation. It's Miami at a go-go price. Low jet excursion fare, palatial oceanfront hotel. Now at reduced rates. Have yourself a go-go vacation at America's Riviera. Everyone can afford. Are we putting you on? Jet with Ashen on the sea. Coast to coast to coast. 